Okay, let's get started. Um, until very recently, the Arctic has been seen by many as a, rem as a remote corner of the planet, mostly untouched by the great affairs of the world. But that's all changing. As global warming melts vast swathes of the Arctic, it will become an important thoroughfare of trade, cutting the length of time, for example, it takes to travel from the Atlantic to the Pacific by 40%. Um, it is also becoming a new source of energy for the world. We have LNG from the Yamal Peninsula going east and west to China uh, and markets in Europe. Some experts estimate that the Arctic accounts for a fifth of the world's undiscovered oil and gas reserves. And as the Arctic becomes more important, it's also becoming the focus of increasing military and political tension. Peaceful for so long, the Arctic risks now becoming a new theater for conflict and tension among the great powers. Ultimately, the Arctic is now more important probably than at any point um, in, human, in world history. My name is John Fracher, Senior Executive Editor at Bloomberg News, and I'm delighted to discuss uh, these topics with our esteemed panel today. So in the beginning, we're going to hear some short speeches from the panelists before embarking on what I hope will be a lively and meaningful uh, debate. Um, let me introduce the panel again very uh, quickly. We have Ernest Solberg, the Prime Minister of Norway. Uh, we have Stefan Lövjan, the Prime Minister of Sweden. Um, we have Soli Ninesto, the President of Finland. And we have Gutni Johansson, the President of Iceland. And of course, the President of Russia, Vladimir Putin, who will now give us some opening remarks. President Putin, please. Distinguished Mr. Niniester, Mr. Johannesson, Madam Silberg, Mr. Levin, ladies and gentlemen, friends, I sincerely welcome all of you to St. Petersburg, the northern capital of uh, Russia. It is a city whose history is closely interconnected with the organization of the legendary Arctic expeditions, the industrial exploration of this unique region, the preservation of its environment and unique culture. It is the fifth time that the International Forum Arctic, the territory of dialogue, becomes a platform for a view, an exchange of views, a wide exchange of views on the agenda. We are grateful to our foreign guests, to the representatives of the countries that are members of the Arctic Council for their willingness to engage in a partnership, as well as for understanding that we've got a joint responsibility for the future of Arctic for its sustainable and stainable, stable development. In 2021, Russia is going to assume its chairmanship in the Arctic Council and will suggest to all member countries of this organization as well as other countries to cooperate in the Arctic. The priorities of our chairmanship all comprise uh, burning issues for the development of the Arctic. I refer in particular to the promotion of environmentally friendly technologies in all fields and industry transport and energy based on the cutting edge environmental standards. We implement our projects in the Arctic and some of them are of global importance. Uh, suffice it to mention the LNG facility and the Yamal Peninsula, the exploration of the Bovenenteske and Karasaveske deposits the Arctic accounts for more than 10% of all investment in Russia. And I'm confident that the Arctic factor is only going to grow in its significance. This year alone, we intend to elaborate and accept the new Arctic development strategy for Russia until 2035. It's going to comprise both our national projects, state programs, investment strategies of infrastructure companies, as well as the programs for the development of Arctic regions and cities in terms of key social and economic parameters, in terms of standards of living. All of the Arctic regions have to be prepared to a level no lower than the Russian average. I'd like to draw attention to the fact that this task should not just be included and defined clearly in our new strategy. It should be a guideline for all federal government agencies and regional authorities of Russia. 
specifics have to be taken into account related to the uh, small indigenous peoples of the north. A special attention should be given to uh, building infrastructure, the bulk and mainstream infrastructure and related as well. And business initiatives have to be promoted as well. Among the key infrastructure projects I can name the construction of the Northern Latitudinal Railway. That's a railway that will allow us to efficiently start exploring the mining reaches of uh, Polo Ural and the Krasnoyarsk region, its northern parts in future, as well as the Arctic as well. And a global transportation corridor is going to be built comprising the northern sea route that is going to work in an uninterrupted fashion all year through. And my message to the Federal Assembly in 2018, I said that we wanted to increase the freight volume there by 2025 to 80 million tons a year. 10, 15 years ago, this figure seemed unattainable, but right now it's a realistic, well-calculated goal, a concrete goal to accomplish last year. Yeah, the freight volume through the Northern Sea Route hit the mark of 20 million, which is three times the Soviet record, which was reached back in 1987. Back then, the Soviet Union organized the transportation of 6.5 million tons of freight, whereas right now it's 20 million. But for this corridor to hit its maximum capacity. We've got to develop, and we're going to develop, the infrastructure, both the sea infrastructure, coast infrastructure, navigation instruments, meteorological satellites, as well as other infrastructure. We invite our foreign partners to help us build hubs and port. I refer to Murmansk and Petropavlos Kamchatsky as the main terminal hubs. We're also going to modernize the Arctic coast ports and organize uh, the capacity for transportation by river and by sea. We're also going to increase our icebreaker fleet. Right now here in St. Petersburg, where we are, currently three new icebreakers are being under construction, Arctic, Siberia, and Ural. On the whole, by 2035, the icebreaker fleet is going to uh, have no less, no fewer than 13 uh, heavy icebreakers, and nine of them are going to be nuclear powered. Our goal is to make the Northern Sea Road secure, safe, and profitable to supplies. It's going to, and it should be uh, attractive in terms of price and the quality of services. The fees have to be well substantiated for icebreaker assistance. And that is why the government is investing into this field in order to minimize the burden, the supplies, the business uh, incurring friends to increase the capital investment into the region. We would like to use all the instruments, in particular those that we have already successfully tested in our development strategies for the Russian Far East. I refer first and foremost to the preferential income tax rates. The decreasing coefficients for the mining tax, as well as a special procedure for the VAT reimbursement. There is also a facilitated procedure for getting plots of land, and there's also a clause of uh, permanence of the conditions for investment projects there. Given the unique nature of the Arctic, the preferences for the businesses are going to be even more advanced, even more sustainable. The government is working together with the experts and business representatives. They have been instructed to come up with a draft federal law on a special preferential system for the investors into the Arctic. I would like to request everyone to do that as soon as possible for this draft law to be adopted by the State Duma as early as its autumn session. Another issue I'd like to draw attention to, ladies and gentlemen, as we know, the uh, 
powers of the Ministry for the Development of the Far East uh, have been expanded. Right now, the Arctic also falls within its remit. That is why I believe it would be a good idea to expand the institutions for the development of the Russian Far East to the Arctic as well. But for that, we need the additional capitalization of the Russian Far East Development Fund for targeted funding of projects. For a comprehensive development of this region to address the issues, non-standard issues that we encounter there so far north, we need a new basis, technological basis, a new human resources basis, and that is why we have already got down to build special training centers, integrating research institutions, universities, businesses, the real sector of the economy. And such a center is also going to be set up in one of our Arctic regions. Its task is to develop fundamental sciences and also applied sciences with regard to the exploration of the Arctic. We believe that the future lies in the hands of active university exchanges, within the hands of international research teams, and we invite all those who are interested to work together in shipbuilding, communications, safety of navigation, and environmental protection, mining, as well as the exploration of bioresources. The Arctic sets before us enormous challenges. We can only live up to them efficiently if we work together. One of these challenges, as I mentioned before, is striking a balance between economic development and preserving the Arctic nature saving its fragile, unique ecosystems, as well as eliminating the damage that has accumulated in the consumerism, consumerist approach to uh, industrial there, activities there. We have been involved in the uh, complete cleanup of the Arctic. Starting from 2012, we have uh, taken away there and, and uh, uh, reprocessed more than 80,000 tons of litter. And there are also six accumulated uh, places of damage in Arkhangel region in Kareli, in Yakutia, in the Malanenetsky district. And uh, we are cleaning up these uh, spots there. And the Kola Peninsula, uh, the Kola Bay is also going to be cleaned up. And we're also establishing a new national parks. I refer first and foremost to the Russian Arctic National Park. It is important to make sure that additional measures are taken for environmental tourism to be fostered here and for the special infrastructure to be set up there. In conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone, the guests of our forum. I am confident that our constructive dialogue is going to help reinforce good neighborly relations as well as mutual trust in the Arctic. And that, in turn, will help us ensure sustainable and peaceful development of the Arctic. Thank you very much for your attention. President Putin, thank you very much. If I could just ask um, a very brief uh, follow-up question before um, our, our next speech. You, you talked a lot about Arctic development, and I want to get onto that later. But as we, at the beginning of this panel, um, I'd like to ask you, I guess, a broad question um, about the politics of the region and indeed the politics of Russia's relations with the EU. Um, today on the stage, we have the leaders of, of Sweden and Norway, and you will be meeting um, them for the first time in a long time. Um, does this feel somehow like a breakthrough moment in the sense that perhaps the bad relations that the EU has had, that Russia has had with the EU um, over the last few years might be starting to thaw? Well, unfortunately, there is a thaw in the Arctic. That's true. And the changes in the temperature in the Arctic are happening at a faster pace than elsewhere on the planet. It, the temperature changes four times as fast in the Arctic. It increases four times as fast as elsewhere in the planet. But as far as political uh, relations are concerned, it is a positive shift, no doubt. Well, in my remarks, uh, I said that we never severed our contacts in the Arctic. Just now, I had a bilateral meeting with the president of Finland, and we recalled that we had had these meetings on a regular basis. Right now, Finland has assumed the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, and Finland has done very much to uh, 
discuss and find a solution to the key issues such as the preservation of the Arctic nature. Finland is paying constant attention to any issues that might arise and that we should address together. The Arctic agenda helps us understand the need for cooperation, for working together jointly to find solutions to the challenges we have. That is very good. Thank you. And we'll be talking about the politics of the region much more later um, in the Q&A. But I think now it's time for President Ernesto of Finland. Please, the stage is yours. Dear <coughs> colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to participate uh, in this forum for the third time. I want to thank you, President Putin, the uh, Russian uh, government, uh, and all the organizers for hosting this event. After Salehard in uh, 2013 and Arkhangelsk in um, 2017, with uh, St. Petersburg, the location of the forum, has now moved even closer to Nordics. And I'm indeed particularly delighted to be sharing this stage with so many Nordic colleagues today. We are living in uncertain times in international relations. Confrontation and rivalry seem to be the rise. As a remedy, you often hear people stressing the importance of dialogue. In those interventions, dialogue is uh, currently seen as a means to reduce tension, to manage risks, and to rebuild trust. Yet, all too often, that is the end of the story. We just talk about dialogue instead of engaging into it. Dialogue is difficult to have unless you actually meet your counterparts. I firmly believe that Arctic issues deserve to be discussed at the level of heads of state and government, face to face in dialogue. This has been the rationale behind the Finnish initiative to convene a first ever Arctic summit. When we <clears throat> sounded out reactions to this idea last year, we received uh, promising signals from all parties. But then tensions ori originating far away from the Arctic intervened with our plans. It is good that at least the tradition of uh, uh, these kinds of uh, forums continues, although it, of course, does not replace the summit idea. Ladies and gentlemen, the main Arctic concern for me continues to be climate change. On the other hand, here in North, we are among the first ones to feel the heat. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as uh, global average. The IPCC report from last autumn shows that Arctic to be one of the most vulnerable systems on our planet. On the other hand, what happens in the Arctic has direct consequences for the rest of the world. The melting of the Arctic Sea accelerates climate, climate change on a global scale. We have to break this vicious circle. We have waited too long before taking action. The good news is that we know what needs to be done. In fact, the two main parts of the global solution are very simple. First, we have to rapidly reduce new CO2 emissions in the atmosphere. The Paris Agreement is a good basis for this, although we still need to increase our level of ambition. Recent uh, indicators from our Russian hosts that uh, they are also planning to ratify the Paris Agreement uh, are most welcome. 
Second, we have to remove old CO2 emissions from the atmosphere. In improving global carbon sinks, the sustainable use of our forests here in the north can play a key role. Beyond uh, CO2, however, there are also other factors contributing to climate change. One of them is black carbon, which uh, is particularly relevant for the fate of the Arctic Sea. When black carbon falls on the white side, ice, it immediately accelerates the melting. Yet, reducing black carbon emissions has an equally immediate positive impact. In a separate event uh, Finland co-hosted here this morning, experts from government, science and business highlighted two promising ways to tackle black carbon emissions in the Arctic. One is uh, modernizing outdated heating and power plants. Another is investing in clean and sustainable shipping. These approaches will not only bring climate and health benefits, they also make sense economically. Ladies and gentlemen, as you well know, for the past two years, Finland has been chairing the Arctic Council. During our chairmanship, uh, we have done our best to maintain the Arctic as a region of opportunity. With our priorities, environmental protection, connectivity, meteorology, and education, we have sought pragmatic cooperation for mutual benefit. Our chairmanship ends um, in four weeks' time when the foreign ministers of all the eight council members meet in Rovaniemi. After that, we hand this responsibility over to Iceland. Two years later, Russia is the uh, next one in line. Together, we must continue to make the best possible use of that exceptional framework. Namely, throughout its uh, existence, the Arctic Council has been a forum for constructive dialogue. This spirit is uh, by no means self-evident in the current international situation. That we have uh, been able to maintain it in the Arctic Council during the past few years is a remarkable achievement. It uh, is also a good objective for the future. Tensions outside the Arctic region must not be allowed to spill over into Arctic Council. But if we want to be more ambitious, we should aim to do more than simply protect the work of the Arctic Council from external controversies. We could also use it as a positive example for others, as a model for reducing tensions elsewhere. As Arctic nations, we know that small practical steps in mutuality, beneficial areas help in building trust, even when major disagreements in other areas persist. This example could be made even more powerful if we find ways to strengthen the cooperation between the Arctic Council and other regional bodies. The Barents Euro-Atlantic Council, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, and the Northern Dimension Partnership all make valuable cont contributions to a functioning Arctic governance. Sharing more information between them and Arctic Council could be beneficial. Ladies and gentlemen, of course, the Arctic region itself is not immune to tensions either. It is clear to all of us that there is a growing strategic and economic interest in the Arctic. As the natural and political climates are changing, many actors see now opportunities in this region. 
and uh, not of all of those sectors are Arctic uh, by de definition. It does not automatically mean that all the new actors come to the region with only selfish intentions. But as the field gets more crowded, risks of confrontation increase. Primarily, I mean confrontation with the delicate natural balance of the Arctic environment. Unfortunately, we can't exclude the possibility of confrontation in the power policy sense either. Questions of hard security have always been kept outside the agenda of the Arctic Council. That has been intentional and uh, it is part of the secret for the success. There's no reason to change that mandate of the Council. However, simply excluding these issues from the Council's agenda will not make them go away. Together, the Arctic states have to find another way to responsibly address these issues too. Once again, dialogue is key. Reducing tensions, managing risks, rebuilding trust. That can only work if we talk to each other. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, President Ines. So a very brief follow-up to that. You talked a, 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 about, you know, in, climate change really is sort of one of the big megatrends behind everything that we're talking about here. And you talked about the urgent need uh, to cut black carbon emissions here in the Arctic. Russia, of course, is the biggest um, economy here. Do you think Russia specifically is doing enough on that score? Actually, we have to see the whole picture. Climate change, CO2 emissions is a part of that, a permanent, a very dangerous part of that. But we talk also about um, black carbon, which is an immediate risk, mm -hmm. and even maybe more risky for the Arctic than the warming up of the globe. Uh, who is warming up our globe? I, I'm afraid I have to answer you that everybody. Who is uh, responsible for black carbon emissions? Well, uh, specifically from that which comes down to uh, Arctic, uh, those who live nearby. Russia, yes, as a big country, but also United States, Canada and the rest of us. And like I said, um, uh, black carbon is an immediate risk, but it's also uh, positively immediate. That is that uh, if we get rid of that, the impact is immediately there. And we'll get, we'll get on to that later in the discussion. Okay. We'll talk more about climate change. But I think now, uh, President Johannesson, you're up. Thank you. President Putin, President Ninesto, Prime Minister Sulberg, Prime Minister Löwen, ladies and gentlemen, Uva Jaime Gosti, it's an honor, it's an honor to be with you here in St. Petersburg today. This is a territory of dialogue. And it's an honor to represent the Republic of Iceland. We have our focus here on the Arctic. In a couple of weeks, Iceland will be assuming the chairmanship of the Arctic Council from Finland. And I can tell you, President Ninesta, but it will be challenging to keep up with the good work and Finland's high-quality leadership in the Council. The Arctic is a key priority in Iceland's foreign policy. In 2011, the Althing, the Icelandic Parliament, 
adopted an Arctic policy with cross-party political support. And believe me, that does not happen all the time in Iceland. Iceland's current government has given Arctic affairs and Iceland's upcoming chairmanship in the Arctic Council a central role in its manifesto. And Arctic affairs are being dealt with in various ways. We have the territory of dialogue. We have the Arctic Circle in Iceland. Arctic frontiers. All these provide excellent venues. But the Arctic Council stands out for its circumpolar nature and its long and successful history of delivering high quality project results in the fields of environmental protection and sustainable development. At the Arctic Council, the Icelandic team will work under the slogan, Together Towards a Sustainable Arctic. In line with that, Iceland will be focusing on three main substance areas. First, the Arctic marine environment. Second, climate and green energy solutions. And thirdly, the people of the Arctic. Now, it should hardly come as a surprise to you that Iceland will keep the oceans at heart during its chairmanship. We are, after all, a nation of some 350,000 people in the middle of the North Atlantic. The ocean surrounds us, full of fish, and then there's just a rock with a few football fields and many happy tourists. But sea, the sea, the sea has been the foundation of our economic prosperity, especially in the last century and into this one. Uh, our success in the last century is directly linked with building up a highly modern and sustainable fisheries sector, which in turn was dependent on us assuming control of our fishing grounds, our exclusive economic zone. It is often portrayed as the fascinating story about a daring underdog willing to take on an overwhelming adversary. On a few occasions in the middle of last century, uh, this happened, providing for some exciting tales about uh, the Icelandic Coast Guard uh, vessels using peaceful means to disrupt the fishing from foreign vessels uh, that enjoyed the protection of one of the mightiest navies of the world at the time. And as a young boy in Iceland, I grew up hearing tales about these uh, skirmishes. And I later learned how multilateral cooperation was influential in bringing an end to these disputes through the negotiations which ultimately uh, led to the Convention on the Law of the Seas, UNCLOS. As President of Iceland, I have a deep interest in all matters relating to the oceans and their central role on our path to achieving a peaceful, prosperous, and sustainable future for all world citizens. I'm glad to notice also that here in St. Petersburg this summer, we will hold uh, the Global Fishery Forum and the Seafood Expo. Iceland will support the Arctic Council's work on an action plan to reduce marine litter and Iceland has plans for organizing an international scientific conference on plastic pollution uh, of the Arctic Ocean in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, in April uh, next year. That was the ocean. That was our concern with uh, the marine environment in the Arctic. Now, climate and green energy solutions. During the Icelandic chairmanship, a particular focus will be given to the so-called blue bioeconomy. That approach can provide positive effects in all three pillars at the same time, uh, reducing waste, strengthening economies, and supporting societal development. But this also underpins 
the wider importance of our Arctic cooperation. And I can confidently say and repeat that we are looking forward to assuming the responsibility from Finland to uh, lead what we believe to be the most uh, representative regional body on Arctic affairs, the Arctic Council. And equally, to ultimately hand the reins over to Russia in two years' time when your able team, President Putin, uh, takes over. So, the third pillar, the third approach, people and communities of the Arctic. During the chairmanship of the Arctic Council, Iceland aims to continue the cooperation on ongoing subjects such as uh, connectivity, social well-being in the Arctic, and this of course includes uh, gender equality, which is a policy priority in Iceland. And the universal principle of, of human rights. And let's not underestimate uh, the value of cultural and academic exchanges. And let's hear the voices of the indigenous populations in the Arctic. They have the right to prosper and flourish. They know their nature. They know what is at stake. I'm reminded of a comment I once heard. A person in a remote region was suddenly in the limelight of the world. And that person said, well, our problems really began when other people started taking an interest in us. Let our increased interest in the Arctic region be a positive force for positive change. Dear friends, I came to this city for the first time in 1990. It had a different name then. It was a different world. I had become fascinated with Russian history, Russian culture, and that feeling still remains. I studied the language. It was a bit harder than I thought. It was probably a blessing. I would never have tried it if I'd known how hard it was. But if we try to understand each other, if we try to engage in an honest dialogue, the risk of conflicts and misunderstandings uh, decreases. And that is exactly why, dear friends, that is exactly why now I will speak Russian at the very end. My Russian is not really fluent and I apologize for that. However, However, I've studied Russian many years ago. I almost forgot it completely. But nonetheless, this is what I still remember. And this is what I still can say. And this is what I'm willing to say right now. There is nothing more precious on the planet Earth than true friendship. Many thank you. Mr. President, thank, thank you for that heartwarming uh, opening to this uh, panel. Um, if I can ask um, to bring it back to sort of every, everyday politics and everyday risks, we, we heard from President Ninesto earlier that the Arctic Council is not a forum for conflict um, resolution, conflict regulation. But do you think, you know, in the light of the growing importance of the Arctic, some of the political tensions we're seeing in the Arctic, that its remit should be expanded to become an arena in which some of these strategic tensions, deeper strategic tensions, can be addressed. Thank you. Uh, I would agree with uh, President Ninesto and his comments previously that the Arctic Council has uh, not been a venue where we discuss so-called hard security. Uh, and I think it is safe to say that the members of the Arctic Council have been pleased with that uh, venue and how we, how we uh, uh, approach our uh, different interests and uh, maybe disagreements, but also and furthermore and primarily our common interests and concerns. So uh, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Uh, and as Ninesto also mentioned, there are other ways to discuss hard security. 
So uh, uh, I think I can see, safely say on behalf of the government of Iceland that, uh, that uh, we look forward to uh, maintaining the principles and spirit of the Arctic Council as it has been so far. So no major changes in your, under your presidency? Butch to put it. We will see. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Prime Minister Silbert, you're next. Presidents and Prime Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, friends of the Arctic, I am thrilled to be here with you to address common issues on the Arctic. Together we will discuss the many opportunities and possible, possible cooperation the region has to offer. But as we meet, there are also cause for concern. The latest reports of uh, new record-breaking temperatures from Canada and elsewhere are alarming. The fact is, the Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the globe. This rapid change is having disturbing impacts on the environment and the living resources of the region. Indigenous people are severely affected. We have no time to waste. We need more dialogue, more cooperation based on international law in order to deal with the risks and the impacts. At the same time, we must look at the opportunities. 10% of Norway's population live in the Arctic. The region is therefore a key national priority. We need a clear vision to ensure resilient societies in the North. Sustainable use of natural resources based on knowledge and innovation is important. And Norway does not have all the answers, but it has a fairly good track record. One reason is that we make decisions based on scientific findings and expert advice. Another one is green thinking. The third reason I would like to underline is the fact that scientists, politicians, and business talk and consult. The people who live, work, and raise their children in the Arctic deserve to live in modern, resilient societies. So we need to invest in uh, infrastructure. We need high quality daycare for children, good schools and universities. We also need football fields, concert halls, and hospitals. I know that Russia has always thought this way. Now we need to adapt this thinking to a green future in the Arctic. And political leadership is crucial. The development and implementation of, a new green, of new greener technologies are driven by political choices. Green thinking is part of the solution and must be framed as a business opportunity. No, and then I hear the Arctic uh, described as a geopolitical political hotspot. This is not how we see it. We know the Arctic as a region of peace and stability, but it should not be taken for granted. It's a result of political decisions and practical cooperation between the Arctic states. There is a well-functioning legal regime in place, and the law of the sea is the most prominent instrument. So respect for international law and regional cooperation are keys to ensuring peace and stability across borders. The regional organization provides a solid architecture for dialogue and practical cooperation in the Arctic. And the Arctic Council is our most important arena for discussing issues of mutual interest in the region. One of the reasons for its success is the fact that it gathers all key stakeholders, including indigenous people. And the Arctic Council makes it possible to find joint solutions to regional challenges and to ensure continued stability and development in the region. The ministerial in Rovaniemi in May will mark the end of a successful Finnish uh, chairmanship. The Arctic Council has done groundbreaking work in documenting climate change in the region. We want the statement from Rovaniemi to deliver a strong message on climate change. 
and we hope that all the member states can agree on this. Norway and Russia are neighbors and cooperating on issues of common interest in the North. The incidents of, of sea agreement, our Coast Guard's collaboration, joint environmental initiatives, and a direct hotline between the Norwegian military headquarters and the Russian northern fleets all demonstrates a well-functioning cooperation between neighbors. Our cooperation in the North is about more than just meetings and documents. It's people-to-people -people contact, which is a valuable uh, contribution to our bilateral relations. It's about swimmers and wrestlers training together in Murmansk. It's about joint Norwegian-Russian orchestras and Norwegians studying in Arkhangelsk. And it's about indigenous peoples who are changing experience over the borders. And more than anything, this cooperation is about common understanding and respect between different cultures. The main platform for our close cross-border contacts is the Barents Cooperation. In October, Norway will assume the chairmanship of the Barents Euro-Arctic Council. And we will work for a stronger and resilient uh, Barents re region with particular focus on health and people-to-people -people contact and knowledge. The oceans is at the heart of most Norwegians. It's a way of life which is a constant in Norwegian history. The sea is our gateway to the world. The ocean economy will continue to be crucial for strong Arctic communities in the future. Healthy oceans are a prerequisite for achieving the sustainable development goals. Ecosystem-based ocean management and cooperation between coastal states on management of transboundary marine resources are important factors. And as maritime nations, the Arctic states have a special responsibility to take action to ensure healthy and productive oceans. Norway and Russia has cooperated actively in the field of marine science for 60 years. During our 40 years of joint fishery management, we have managed to protect the environment and harvest fishery resources of the Barents Sea in a sustainable manner. And as a result of this, the Northeast Atlantic cod and other fish stocks in the Barents Sea are among the best managed in the world. This cooperation is something to be proud of, and it should serve as an example for other countries and regions to follow. Now marine litter is a growing threat to life in sea. Norway and Russia are now joining forces to combat marine litter on the, uh, in the Barents Sea. All Arctic states need to reduce the threats that could undermine the potential of the oceans. And we need to, to make the best possible use of the ocean resources to the benefit of our coastal communities and the people who live there. Our goal is both to protect the ocean and to optimize their value. This is why I also have established a high-level panel for sustainable ocean economy, which consists of leaders of 14 coastal states who are supported by a global group of experts. In October, Norway will host the seventh of our ocean conference, and we will emphasize the importance of a sustainable ocean economy and a knowledge-based management of sea and coastal areas. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by once again underlining the importance of dialogue and cooperation. I would therefore like to thank our Russian hosts for bringing us all together for this important discussion on the opportunities and challenges in the Arctic. Exchanging view makes us a little wiser, and a wise approach is needed to ensure a responsible future for the Arctic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, as I alluded to, as I said at the beginning of this panel, it, it's been a long time uh, since the Norwegian Prime Minister came to meet 
uh, President Putin. Why, why did you decide now was the time? Has anything changed? I got a good invitation. <laughs> um, oh, I think the, the prospect of this conference, the discussion on Arctic and the oceans, is so important and it binds our countries together because this is the core issues that we have been uh, cooperating on for such a long time. A lot of our bilateral cooperation have been about these issues. So it's uh, of importance for us. Mm -hmm. It's Norway is also international. Maybe the biggest issue on our international agenda these days mm -hmm. is linked between oceans and the Arctic. So a good invitation. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister Levin. The last speech is yours. Thank you. President Putin, President Nidister, President Johannesson, Prime Minister Solberg, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a true pleasure to attend such a distinguished forum, and I would like to begin by thanking President Putin and, of course, the, the government of the Russian Federation for gathering us here in St. Petersburg, a gem of beauty and splendor on the Baltic Sea. It is a city with deep historical significance for Swedish-Russian relations, reminding us of peaceful and less than peaceful times in our long and shared history, or to borrow from the great Pushkin, and I quote, from here, the Swede is ill-protected. A city on this site, to thwart his purposes, shall be erected, end of quote. Today, St. Petersburg, <laughs> today, St. Petersburg provides an excellent venue for a dialogue on the Arctic. And the Arctic is a region that has long been characterized by peace, stability, and constructive international cooperation based on respect for international law. And let me emphasize that one of Sweden's core interests is to keep the Arctic that way. And we have all together so far, and not least thanks to the Arctic Council, been uh, successful in building a political environment that generates win-win solutions. We have completed and concluded a number of legally binding agreements that foster closer ties on search and rescue, on oil spill prevention, and scientific cooperation. The Arctic Council's working groups continue to produce world-class reports scientific reports on the challenges facing the Arctic. Let me also highlight the Barents Euro Arctic Council currently shared by Sweden, and not least its focus on regional project-oriented cooperation and people-to-people -people contacts, which are important in a time when borders are increasingly closing. In this sense, the Arctic is an example to be proud of. By working closely together and in good faith, we are now able to strengthen our cooperation for peace and stability and realize the immense potential of this region, of our region. But the Arctic not only offers opportunities, it also poses some very significant challenges. The scientific findings are beyond doubt. A climate crisis in the Arctic is not some future scenario. It happens as we speak. The Arctic Council reports that annual temperatures in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18 were all higher than any year since 1900. And September sea ice volume has declined by 75% since 1979. It is often said that what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. That is true. But it's also true that the causes of what happens in the Arctic 
are not often found in the Arctic. So global mobilization of resources and action is required to deal with the challenges facing the Arctic. There is a new Arctic emerging, and it requires new responses, new action geared at adaptation and resilience, and we are all in this together. Global warming and its effect on the Arctic may not only lead to an environmental and ecological disaster, potentially they are a security threat of global proportions. In addition, there is an invoice waiting for us. Arctic warming could result in a cumulative net cost of $90 trillion by the end of this century. Now, the 2030 Agenda and the Paris Agreement represent a paradigm shift, enabling us to embark on the development of our societies and fulfilling our aspirations to provide a good life, not only for ourselves, but also for future generations. We are on the verge of the global transformation of our energy system from fossil fuel to renewable energy. And this transformation is just as morally right as it is financially smart. History tells us that major transformation driven by technology and innovation create opportunities and economic growth. And I'm convinced that the future belongs to those who embrace the new green economy to those who invest in sustainable technologies and renewable energy systems, and to those who seek innovation for the future rather than solutions from the past. And that is why Sweden has set a target of becoming carbon neutral by 2045. In the long term, the low carbon story is the only growth story on offer. Ladies and gentlemen, the Arctic is not just an isolated region of ice, of wild nature or harsh landscapes. It is a region very much defined by the people who live there. The Swedish Arctic, as an example, is reindeer herding, important mining, top-ranking universities. It is breathtaking environments popular tourist destinations, it is high-tech IT installations, and the space industry. So the North should develop, and its people should be able to live good lives just like anywhere else in our societies. And this underscores the need for sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. With science-based policies, the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda, we have a solid foundation to build on. Our common goal to save the Arctic requires new scientific research, business innovation, shared priorities, and not least, a political will. So we need many determined steps towards a sustainable future, and with our grandchildren in mind, I would say, let's go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to open up the, the, panel, the panel discussion where we will touch on many of the issues uh, that we've talked about in the opening, um, in the opening speeches. Um, I'd like to start with energy in, in the Arctic. And President Putin, you talked a lot about Russia expanding its energy infrastructure um, in the Arctic. And indeed, exploiting the Arctic's reserves has been one of your grandest ambitions as president. And yet, when you look at, at the global energy market and trends in the global energy market, we see that the world is moving towards renewable energy. The world is awash with uh, US shale. 
And as Rosneft has discovered, sanctions are making it much harder uh, for Russia to do big offshore projects. I think it's been five years now since Rosneft struck oil in the Arctic. So my question to you is, is there, is there a risk that Russia has missed its chance here? That somehow this Arctic dream that you've had will end in disappointment? I would like to ask the moderator to give me just two minutes to comment on the speeches my colleagues have just delivered, if you have no objections. Thank you very much. First on foremost, we've got some differences with Sauli as to what our data says about the warming in the Arctic. According to our data, Arctic warms as fast uh, four times and uh, uh, in two times, as Sauli has said. So we think it's four times as fast, and Finland says it's two times as fast. But anyway. Very rapidly in every case. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Uh, now, as for suit, I know this is a very serious matter black suit, black carbon. We have different calculations uh, as to how many emissions there are in different countries, and our differences as to the calculations can differ widely. But when I was there in the north, I, I told that in the old ice uh, layers f during the medieval times, for instance, there were a lot of uh, big layers of uh, black carbon even though there were no industrial emissions. Sometimes the emissions from one single volcano can amount to more than all the emissions humanity has done because of its automobile transportation. But it's a very serious matter, and our experts are working on that. But what's very important, and I agree with Sauli completely on that matter, indeed, if our vessels, if our ships transition to more environmentally friendly types of fuel, I mean uh, gas motor fuel, then the vessels working in the Arctic are going to be far more environmentally friendly, and that is very important. And we should certainly incentivize shipbuilding companies and uh, transportation companies to transition to new types of fuel, more environmentally friendly. Now, as for your question whether Russia, the biggest economy of the region, doing enough to ensure environmental security there. But I've got to correct you. Russia is not the biggest economy of the Arctic region because according to the, well, yes, according to the IMF in PPP terms, it's China that ranks first. It is uh, even ahead. Mr. President, that is China an Arctic country? No, no, no. It's a new definition. No, no, no. Just uh, bear with me. Bear with me a little bit because I'm with you. Uh, second, it's the U.S. And the U.S. and Canada are both Arctic countries. But unlike the U.S., Russia has adopted and implemented Tokyo Agreement and the Paris Agreement. We've signed it, and we intend to implement it. Moreover, Russia has committed itself to decrease its emissions by 20 to 30 percent as compared to the 1990 benchmark. And of course, uh, we're going to analyze the consequences, comprehensive consequences of all these uh, agreements and their implementation. But this is the direction that we have decided to take. So far, no one understands completely the reasons, the causes for this warming. Maybe it's just due to the emissions, or maybe there are more important factors, global factors, that also contribute to that. But anyway, it's not going to be worse if we decrease the emissions. And that is why Russia has taken this commitment. But Russia is not the biggest economy in the Arctic. In PPP terms, we rank sixth. China, US, uh, India, Japan, uh, Germany, and then Russia. Well, of course, we are going to try to, to go ahead to get bigger. Now, as uh, for this, from here, the sewage is ill-protected city on this site to thwart his purposes shall be erected. I've got to remember another poem, Paul Tower. Hooray, we go forward. 
the Swedes are giving way. Yes, this is what is said in Poltava. This is what we usually remember when we see Russian soccer matches. And unfortunately, these matches do not often give us chance to remember these uh, poems because the the hockey team of Sweden is wonderful, and it is also a source of pleasure for our fans. And sport is what brings together our countries in humanitarian terms. It would be very nice, uh, Prime Minister Levin, if one of your clubs uh, uh, participated in the matches of our Continental Hockey League. But that is outside our today's discussion anyway. Now, Now, moving on to the question you have asked, whether Russia has missed a chance in terms of exploring these resources, no, certainly that is not the case. First and foremost, these resources are enormous. They have uh, a planetary significance. In terms of uh, forecast deposits, Arctic is home to around 13 billion tons of uh, oil and 95 trillion cubic meters of natural gas. These are colossal deposits of planetary proportions. We have already started the exploration. You know, we have the head of the Yamal LNG project here. It is an international uh, project. Yes, there are sanctions, there are some restrictions, they are deleterious, and yet these uh, restrictions cannot stop us from this process, from exploring the Arctic. Let me remind you once again that whatever the sanctions, the first natural gas from Yamal LNG was uh, the first batch was to the United States of America, because that is uh, profitable to our American partners. If they find a project profitable, they do it. If they think it's not profitable to them, then they decide to abandon it. But uh, recently, they have not been paying that much attention to the interests of other countries. Well, this project, we've done it, and we're going to do other projects as well. We're going to expand them, depending on how fast humankind is transitioning from fossil fuel to alternative sources of energy? Well, that is a question that is still needs to be answered. According to experts, the energy consumption in the coming decades is going to increase, whereas the ratio between hydrocarbons, renewables, nuclear power, and hydropower, well, this ratio, this proportion is going to remain more or less the same. As of now, whether Luckily or unluckily, this uh, proportion between different sources in the energy mix is not changing, whereas the overall volume of energy consumption is growing. But we should remember Russia has a great hydropower potential, and we are going to develop our nuclear power. The uh, nuclear power still accounts just for 16 percent in our energy mix, whereas in France it's uh, 90 percent or more than that. We need to hit at least 25 percent. Our partners in Finland are also going to build some nuclear power plants. So we didn't miss our opportunity. And now as for this uh, sanction pressure, whether that hinders us, yes, it does, but not critically. Moreover, it nudges us towards developing our own technologies more actively. Last year alone, we invested in import substitution around 600 billion. How much was that? How much did we invest last year in import substitution? Our Minister for Economic Development doesn't remember. Well, and several hundreds, billions, rubles, and rubles, yes. So this is going to continue. And we're going to boost our efforts in that regard. And that is already yielding a positive result. Of course, it would be better to live without any restrictions that distort the market, distort the world trade, 
result in slower economic growth rates for the global economy as a whole, we would be better off without restrictions. But our plans for exploration, well, they're not going to be impeded by that. But do, do not worry. Yes, you're right. The Yamal um, LNG story has been very successful to date. And no one doubts the fact that there are lots of um, you know, deep oil and gas reserves in, in, in the Arctic. But getting it out of the, out of the sea is extremely expensive. Yes, it's there, but do you think it's going to be economically viable for Russia to do this, given the headwinds that we've talked about, sanctions, the energy transition, etc.? Well, I have told you, we do not see this transition. We see that mankind is trying to develop alternative sources of energy, but so far there is no transition, radical transition from hydrocarbons to renewables. Well, of critical for those who produce oil and gas. It's not about oil or gas even. The thing is, mostly it's coal that is used by uh, heat-powered power plants, whereas uh, not gas, whereas natural gas is one of the cleanest hydrocarbons. It's mostly coal that does most damage and that is still burned a lot in the world. That is what we should be giving thought to. Yes, some countries decrease the share of coal, but others don't, and that is what requires our attention. And I see no problem there at all. Well, uh, incidentally, in Russia, we are working on developing our renewables, alternative sources of energy, and we're going to continue this process. There is no threat that I see right now. Now, as for the costs, the expensive costs, you, you mentioned yourself the shale in the US. We, we know how it happens. They use hydro fracture, and this hydraulic fracture is the most environmentally unfriendly method for producing oil. You know the you know maybe that better. In those states where hydraulic fracturing is used, uh, they see uh, terrible water coming from their water taps. Maybe this is an issue they're trying to address, but it still is very difficult. And whether hydraulic fracture is profitable, well, the costs are far greater than the costs uh, Russian oil producers incur even in the most remote areas. So we feel quite confident. Moreover, if uh, prices, oil prices go lower than $40, then the profitability of oil production, shale oil production in the US are going to be uh, called into question. Well, of course, technologies are developing. Maybe the profitability of uh, such methods is going to be uh, higher. Maybe it's going to be still profitable, even under $40 per barrel, maybe uh, under 35 or so. But still, in Russia, it's more profitable for oil production. And for gas, it is even more profitable. And I'm not going to cite the figures not to scare anyone. The profitability in Russia is far better in uh, the US, in Europe, and even in some uh, oil and gas producing countries in the Middle East. And one final, one final question for you on the Arctic energy. Do you, given these, you know, it's still quite expensive to get oil and gas out of the Arctic, and there are these headwinds we've talked about. Is there a case for special tax breaks for Russian companies to make it worth their while? And can we expect more of them? Yes, I've mentioned already that we are uh, creating and keep creating beneficial conditions for companies which are working in a rather harsh Arctic conditions. It has to do not only with the lack of infrastructure in Arctic, it has to do with the need to invest into technologies which will 100% help us to uh, maintain our nature, which is rather um, vulnerable in Arctic. All my colleagues sitting here know this quite well. Uh, first and second, doing this, we have to take into account the interests of, our, uh, of people living there. Um, and uh, this is additional uh, burden for companies, and it should be shared by the state. 
Prime Minister Solberg, let me move on to you. Um, believe it or not, the, the most read story on Bloomberg's website yesterday focused on Norway. And it asked the question, is Europe's biggest petroleum producer falling out of love with oil? It talked about some of the environmental concerns, specifically about the, Lofo the Lofoten Islands, I believe um, it's pronounced. Um, and of course, as we've been discussing, and especially for Norway, oil and gas exploration um, has been very disappointing for Norway in the Arctic um, over the last uh, few years. It seems like every week, every other week, we hear a story about another, another failure, another dud um, location so to speak, when it comes to finding oil. So can I ask you, is this true? Is Norway now fa falling out of love with, with oil? No, I don't think Norway is falling out of love with oil and gas. But I think we are very concerned about also the CO2 footprint that our country is giving to the world. And that's why we have very harsh regulations on its, uh, how you explore it. That's why we also are taxing and putting all the CO2 uh, uh, um, emissions out of our production into the ETS system, European quota system for emissions, so that uh, taxation on your emissions through productions are very high. Mm. Uh, and, um, uh, but of course, we are also very much in love with our oceans, and Lofoten is a symbol in Norway of uh, that's where but that's where the cod is really making the babies. So it's, uh, uh, this is a very plentiful area, and it's, um, uh, it has, that's where the stockfish that we have produced for five, six hundred years and sold to Portugal for their Christmas meals and things in Brazil and others. It's, uh, that's where it comes from. It's also part of, uh, and it's exquisite natural uh, areas. So there's sometimes conflicts in it, but Norway still is going to produce oil and gas. We will continue to explore. We are now developing the fourth largest um, area that we have on oil and gas, which is the Svadup field, which is now into its second round of development, which means that I was in government 15 years ago, and we thought we had peaked. And then we found new areas, and now we think we are peaking these days. And maybe we are, maybe not, because we will still look and, and still explore. But of course, especially in the Arctic area, we have to take extraordinary concerns about the environment. And we have also the cost level is higher, meaning that uh, they have to be extra profitable to be developed. So the Arctic, when it comes to oil exploration, is there are still opportunities there. It's not. There are still opportunities. And we just, uh, through this uh, yearly round of um, surroundings to already explored areas, we, we bid out a large uh, amount. And we are looking for the companies to come back with their proposals mm. to where they will look for it. And, and this licensing system of already opened areas. And, and we still believe it's profitable, but it will be. Uh, we, we do know that the world is. Uh, demanding uh, cleaner energy. But one of the things that is important is to see that in Europe there is a need for uh, natural gas as a transmitter into the low carbon uh, societies of the future. And natural gas has half the uh, amount of CO2 emission as uh, coal has. And of course, that's, uh, that there will be a need in this transmission in Europe. And when the uh, Quote, the, the ETS, the emission system, now has really increased the costs the last mm. two years, so that the cost of CO2 emissions in the European Union is much higher now than just two years ago. That means that the cost difference, but the, the CO2 emission difference between coal mm. and, and gas will, in fact, be much bigger, that we can increase the transformation from coal to gas that we have been quite looking for the last 10 years. Mm. President Johansson, let me, let me turn to you. Um, we've heard a lot about, I guess, a lot of the, the bad things that are happening right now. There's the environmental threat, um, climate change, um, of course, is melting um, the oceans. But you know, you're as a small nation in the North Atlantic. How does your country, how does Iceland, stand to benefit from the changes we're, we're seeing in the Arctic? In, in the Arctic, what are the opportunities for you from all of the changes that we're seeing? Well, first of all, I don't think you should look at uh, negative developments and uh, say to yourself, well, maybe something good will come out of this. Uh, we don't see the effects of climate change as producing uh, positives 
for us. But changes, there are, changes there will be, and we will, of course, have to adapt. Uh, the uh, potential for increased traffic in the Arctic region, the potential for the Northern Sea Route as the uh, means to uh, uh, ship products between uh, the Far East and Europe uh, needs to be taken into consideration. And we will observe developments there and see how we can contribute and how that affects uh, the Icelandic economy in a positive way. So in this sense, uh, uh, the Arctic and changes in the Arctic uh, opens up uh, new realities for us. But we've gone beyond joking that uh, climate change and global warming will only benefit us. It doesn't, it's not funny anymore. Hmm. And uh, that is one thing. Uh, the overall importance to move from fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy uh, also indicates and implies that we can uh, chip in. Uh, yes, we happen to be a rock in the middle of the North Atlantic, but an active geological rock. We have geothermal energy and uh, as it happens, because we mentioned uh, energy sources uh, in the Arctic, uh, geothermal is one potential for clean energy production uh, in Kamchatka, for instance, and uh, Icelandic and Russian experts and companies have been working together, and uh, there is potential there for, uh, for um, a sustainable use of these resources. So let me just conclude that uh, climate change with its uh, negative effects does not open up positive possibilities, but new realities. And we are part of that world. Mm -hmm. uh, Prime Minister Levin, let me, turn, let me turn to you and I'll, I'll ask you um, um, a similar question to the one I asked of, my, of your Norwegian colleague. This is the first time that a Swedish Prime Minister has met uh, President Putin uh, for a long time. Um, is this a sign that you are no longer as concerned about Crimea and on, on, on some of the other issues <clears throat> of disagreement um, as you've been in the past? Has anything changed? Now, look, um, I'm here because the, the Arctic Council and the Arctic uh, region is very important to Sweden, to all of us. We're here to, to cooperate, to discuss what we can do the best to reduce climate change and to, to make the Arctic region a, a, a prosperous region also in the future. Uh, Russia, this is my message. Russia is a very important country in our neighborhood. It's a large country. We have a lot of uh, common interests, be it investment, business, climate, culture, people to people, ice hockey. Mm. Uh, and over the years, we have, we have seen so many fantastic uh, Soviet Union and Russia ice hockey players and ice hockey teams. Uh, so, um, and, and my president, my, the team I'm following is not in the shape to play in KHL mm. yet, but we, we'll see. But, but there we are, and we need a cooperation, the best possible understanding, but at the same time, Sweden also, as a small nation, a non-aligned nation, will also stick to very important principles that we believe is important. But we need to, to handle both of these. So, so uh, we want a, a good relation with Russia, and at the same time, we're also clear where things we, we believe perhaps we have different views on. And we'll get, we'll, we'll get on to those different views um, uh, later on. I'm sure. <laughs> President Ninesto, um, I mean, Finland has the presidents, the rotating presidency of the EU, I believe, starting um, in July. Do you see signs that relations between the EU and Russia are perhaps starting to thaw along with the Arctic ice? And, and could you imagine you know, the conversation changing on sanctions? Well, maybe <clears throat> I'll start with the sanctions. It's, uh, very, very clear to everybody, I'm sure, that 
sanctions were imposed because of Russian behavior, and if that is not taken away, sanction, sanctions will remain. That's very simple indeed. Then <clears throat> to finish EU presidency, we should uh, notice that uh, the importance of presidency in EU is not the same anymore. When we look at the discussions on Brexit, have you seen EU president, uh, presidency taking part to that? No, it's taken <clears throat> all to Brussels. Uh, but I don't mean to say that uh, we couldn't do a lot. And uh, maybe my own opinion is that maybe we should start from inside the EU. I would like to make a, a question to all EU members. What common have we? That is a question you usually put uh, to a divorce case. To, to wife and husband, do you still have something in common? If they find common, they'll continue. And uh, I think that we are in the states uh, in EU where we should really discuss about whether we have something in common. I believe we have. Then to outside relations, uh, uh, I tried to tell you earlier in my speech that uh, we all say Dialogue is important. You hear it from every month. But uh, usually it stays there. We just state that it is important, but nothing happens. Uh, what Finland and I, I, I'm sure also during our presidency we are trying to do is to have that dialogue, not only say that it's important, and have a dialogue with Russia too. Because um, at the end, in spite of what has taken place in Ukraine, we still, uh, actually from Ural to Atlantic, we are Europe. And we are, Europe is uh, the neighbor of Russia and uh, vis a vis. So usually it is wise to uh, stay in as good relations with your neighbor that are possible. President Putin, you want to get in on that? It's actually, I'm willing to react to that. Coming back to the question of sanctions and the situation around the Crimea. Well, as far as I understand, Crimea is not part of the Arctic zone. However, I'd like to say the following. We've gathered here in order to discuss the problems of the Arctic. And we really wouldn't like to see that because of the fact that we failed to act. And as we all know, it can be a crime not to act. So we don't want anybody to be sitting and doing nothing and committing this crime of doing nothing so that Arctic turns into something similar to the Crimea. And in the meantime, Crimea might turn into something very similar to a desert. And that's what we're talking about. And that's not an empty metaphor. If you take a look at the sediments that you can find in the Arctic, you would see there the remnants of tropical trees and animals of the flora and fauna of the tropical region. So that has happened before to the humankind. We need to be aware of those processes and react accordingly. Coming back to the historical track record, when the greatest reformer emperor of Russia, Peter the Great, and a very romantic king, Karl XII, had a war and were carrying out the war because of the territories. A lot of time has passed since then, and some of the problems that we discussed today can only be resolved through unification of our efforts. And this is exactly why we're here today, and I hope it would be beneficial for all of us. 
coming to the question of the EU and the mutual exchange of strikes, uh, and by that I mean the sanctions, you definitely know, as you're from Bloomberg, according to the assessment of the European Commission for 2015-2016, the losses of the EU amounted to around 50 million euro, and the losses of Russia are around 25 to 26 million euro. Billion euro. So it is very clear that the European Union is losing more than we do. According to the German assessments, the profits that the Germany had failed to gain is 56 billion. For the case of Russia, it is three times less. And we're not even happy about that. It's just the amount of cumulative losses that we're all carrying. And this is the damage that everybody is getting to feel. Now, coming back to the nature of sanctions. Any sanctions, if they are legal, have to be sanctioned by the Security Council of the UN, and that is not the case, which makes those sanctions illegal. And the second and most important, for some reasons, nobody is introducing sanctions for interference in the domestic affairs of other countries, interference in the political life of other countries. Nobody is introducing sanctions against those who bring it to a point when other countries are forced to take certain actions to protect their interests. Let us get back to standard compliance with international law and the Charter of the United Nations. Probably by that time we would not have to think of the consequences of the bombing of Yugoslavia or all those issues connected with blatant violations of international rules and their consequences. Let us get back to normal political life. Let us get to feel that this world is dramatically interdependent and we need to work together to succeed. But Mr. President. You, 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 you are known around, you know, everywhere as a, as a realist, um, as a pragmatist. You might not feel like sanctions are fair, but the, there's a lot of European powers still feel strongly that they need to stay in place. So how, what is your feeling about how long these sanctions are going to last? Is this going to last for 10 more years? Is this Russia's future as far as the eye can see? Well, I would say the future of Russia does not depend on the sanctions. The future of Russia only depends on us, on how efficient we'll be in managing our political system, how democratic this system would be, and whether this system will be able to bring forward the best in our society whether we'll be able to use and boost the creative energy of our people, how efficient we would be in managing that. It is conditioned on how efficient we would be to use the internal potential of the Russian economy. As I was saying, around 600 billion were invested last year, 637 to be precise, that's the amount spent for import substitution, but that is money put to work. We have amazing stance at science and education. We just have to keep this system going and move forward. And I'm confident that we shall succeed. And the same applies to implementation of our national projects. However, the sanctions is a tool. And if we want the tool to be efficient, that it has to be the tool at the disposal of the Security Council at the UN. As for the rest, all the issues have to be resolved in the process of dialogue and we cannot impose our own agenda to any other country. And that's it. Just look, all those sanctions today are used no longer as a tool of geopolitical fight. They're used as a tool of competitive fight in this world, as a tool of competition. Just take a look at the Nord Stream 2. Our US colleagues are struggling against that. But it is so obvious that Nord Stream 2 is beneficial for the European partners, but they still insist don't build it. It's very hard to work with the EU. Very many countries, all decisions made in consensus. If you take a look at our relationship with Turkey, we already built our part of um, the Turkish stream on the border of the Black Sea. It will become operational very soon, but we still have not reached the agreement with the EU. And we've had a very similar situation back in the 60s, the same level of counteraction from the United States. It was a project ex gas in exchange for piping with the German Republic. And the same was happening in the case of Nord Stream 1. If the Nord Stream 1 wasn't here today, what would be happening to the international energy sector? I can tell you. The prices, the energy prices would be even higher. That's it. 
Do you want to buy mineral resources at high prices? Probably not. What else needs to be done in order to apply more pressure on the EU? Maybe you can only force them to tackle the difference in prices of the Russian LNG and the US LNG. And maybe we should force them to compensate for the differences from their national budgets, because it is 30 percent difference in prices. And this is a market situation. You cannot possibly use this opportunity and violate the rules of the market economy. No household is willing to pay for that. So what should we do in order to put everybody in equal conditions? You have to compensate for the difference in those prices from the budget. But how cynical would that be? So I think if it keeps on going this way, that is not an excluded option. But it's not up to choose. It's up to the European partners to make this choice. And think of the higher budget spent on the defense. Why is that happening? Do you think that is due to the fact that the international situation is deteriorating? No, that's just a pretense. The key reason behind that is to get extra European money and to get the US defense military still working on a full scale. And the Europeans are to pay for that. That's the reason. And in order to avoid that type of scenario, we all need to get back to compliance with the norms of international law. We've discussed that more than once. President Inesso, you wanted to say something about that? As a representative of the European countries. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I have a feeling that we have uh, <clears throat> traveled far away from Arctic through um, <clears throat> divorces to European Union and now to Crimea. But um, uh, actually, I take uh, the Minsk agreement here, not taking any side on that, but it's an excellent example. Excellent example that I'm sure that everybody would be satisfied if Minsk agreement would be fulfilled by letter to letter. Everybody would say, OK, this is fine. And that has been agreed. But that doesn't happen. And this is something I tried to, with my opening remarks, to tell that, uh, yes, we need dialogue. We need some kind of, uh, well, co-understanding, not uh, uh, having the same opinion of everything, but something like we have here in Arctic Council. Mm -hmm. If uh, we would have in Arctic Council our, our own Minsk agreement or whatever Stavanger agreement, it would have been fulfilled with this kind of spirit. Thank you. Mr. Levine, you wanted to get in? <laughs> yes, and, and out of that uh, at the same time. Uh, because <laughs> I, I think, uh, as President Nina said, I think we've moved from the Arctic region uh, but I must say just quickly that, that uh, as a small uh, non-aligned country, of course, it is very important for us to see that international law is adhered to, mm -hmm. that the European security order is adhered to. Because if it's not, the population in Sweden will also start to wonder. With more insecurity in our neighborhood, the population in Sweden will also start to wonder what's happening and how, what, what can we do to, to, to protect ourselves. But, but I, I do want to emphasize still that we, we and at the same time that we have these, this opinion and the, the differences in, in views, perhaps, uh, we also need at the same time to have the best possible relation that we can. And the Arctic region is a very uh, good example of that, where we can work together. And I, uh, for one, believe that the, the people that are now living in this region they expect us now also to deliver some answers on the climate change, on new jobs, on new technology, uh, and how to balance uh, the right to, to use the resources that, that are there and, and on the one hand and the climate issue on the other hand. So uh, I would prefer if we could move into that area as well. Otherwise, we're spending the whole, this whole seminar on discussing Ukraine, and that is, as the president just said, is not part of the Arctic region. But is it not, I have a, just one follow-up question to that, though. Is, Sorry. Is there a risk that the Arctic nations are in denial? Like, you, you sort of want, it sounds like you all, and it's understandable, you want the Arctic to remain a harmonious place of cooperation. 
but as I said in my introduction, the world is coming to the Arctic as it opens up and it becomes more strategically important. Everything becomes interconnected. The Arctic is no longer, from what I can say, the Arctic is no longer this isolated place that lives by its own rules. It's been globalized, and with that comes opportunity, but also these political tensions. Uh, clearly you're right, so, so we cannot be naive. Hmm. We have a, a new scenario ahead of us, of course, and, and that uh, as we can also see there are so many countries and other actors uh, being interested in our Arctic hmm. region. I think we have some 39 uh, observers right now, among them 13 states. So, so of course there's an interest, uh, but, I, but my, my point is that, that we as countries in this Arctic region, we have uh, uh, also an interest to to keep this as a low tension area. So if we, from the beginning, can say this is a low tension area, we want to keep it that way, then we have a, at least a strategy, a goal to work from. But, but you're right, there are challenges uh, with the globalization and, and the, the, the changed uh, scenario for the, for the Arctic, definitely. Prime Minister Zilberg, thank you. Yes, well, Norway is not a member of the European Union, but we are a NATO country, mm -hmm. like Iceland, so it's, um, uh, and we are in line with the sanctions. We have been that, but we have done this. We've said that this is an international response to an international situation, that we are in line. We do not believe, we, we do see different difference between Norway and Russia and a lot of issues like on the international field, but we at the same time trying to develop a strategy that we also can cooperate on common challenges in areas where it's natural to cooperate. And I believe that is also the core area for the Arctic to discuss. Yes, there will be more people moving there in, in, when it comes to economic activity. There will be more cruise ships. There will be more, more uh, research, development, uh, industrial activity in those areas. That means that we have to work on how we are prepared to that. Mm. For example, one of the areas where Norway and Russia have a long-standing cooperation is on search and rescue which is going to become a much bigger challenge. It's just a couple of weeks ago we had a large cruise ship outside the shores of uh, southern parts of Norway who were in a crisis where the, when the engine stopped. We had to mobilize resources. We know that if we go far further north, it will be more difficult. These are areas that we, mm. we, cannot, we cannot just sink into the common discussion on Everything is interconnected, so we can't do anything. We have to start to sort single issues, and I think it's our political responsibility to our electors and our voters that we also answer to the big issues, but also to cooperation in, for example, the Arctic region. And you're right, cooperation in the Arctic region is very important, but you have, as Prime Minister of Norway, for example, you have to balance that against the news, for example, that we saw last week, that two Russian bombers were flying over the Norwegian Sea. That must make it hard. That must, how does that make you feel? You have to balance, on the one hand, the need for Arctic cooperation against these real political threats. Well, we do that by sending up our fighter planes to meet them. Mm -hmm. We do that by... Uh, we have done this, I mean, this is something that has happened for years between our countries. I have to remember this through the Cold War, through the peaceful, but we, we still, we meet them, we say, and we do, we, we, always, we always notify when we have military exercises. This is one of the things that Norway does. We keep the protocols that we decided on in the 90s. We tell, we have a direct line to the Northern Command, and we are telling them, we have an exercise. This is what we're going to do. You are invited. When we had a large Trident Juncture uh, military exercise for NATO, we invited Russian observers to come. They came. They participated. We would like to see a little bit more of that from Russia, to be honest. And, you know, if we could also come, if we were invited, it would be nice to see. Because we want to be, be open. We want to show what we are doing. We want to make sure that there are no incidents, that, 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 that we don't stumble into any situations. But yes, there are disagreements. And we accept and, and understand that Russia has a very legitimate um, military and defense issue in the North. We also, as a nation, and as a smaller nation, as a neighbor, has a security need in the north and we have to find a way to balance this mm -hmm. because that that might sometimes different between our countries but openness that we give response to each other that we that we talk about the issues and that we are trying to make sure that 
the need that Russia has to take care of their security is not in direct opposition to the need Norway has for, mm. for our security. President Ernesto, did you want to get in on that? Uh, not to that, but actually a bit earlier you yes. referred to the fact that uh, others are coming to Arctic. I think, I think if we stay on Arctic, we have this environmental mm. question, and the second one is that it is more interesting to everybody. And like I said earlier, everybody is not coming without selfish ideas. Uh, so what is the position of Arctic Council and us eight members? I think that we should take care from the Arctic in a way that nobody else can blame us that, well, you need some help here. No, let's take care of it ourselves. And uh, it is a totally different issue if somebody wants to use Arctic by the rules which uh, are there already. Mm. I think this is uh, one of the major questions in the future if we let uh, the ice melt uh, that uh, the interest is increasing heavily. President Johansson. Let's continue with Ninesto's concluding words, the ice is melting. Uh, that has led, for instance, to the opening up of the ocean, the opening up of potential uh, fishing grounds, and within the Arctic Council and within other Arctic bodies, we have witnessed and benefited from cooperation, proactive thinking, as it were. Let's not first quarrel about how we divide and utilize this resource. Let's, let's decide first on how we do this in a sustainable manner. And we do it on scientific research, scientific advice. And it's done in, I'm inclined to say, Surprising harmony, because if there is anything nations can disagree on, it is fish. We have had disputes with the British, even with our good friends, the Norwegians. And uh, uh, it, is, it is a positive sign. And I think with all our conflicts and issues and challenges and problems in the world, we should at least be able to point our finger to what we're doing well and uh, without closing our eyes to all the other uh, tasks ahead let's be able to say well the arctic council has worked fine and let's just continue uh, down that road and what is that road it is the road of cooperation it is the road of scientific cooperation and advice and uh, the focus on uh, a sustainable use of our resources and of course it goes without saying that the, the less uh, military emphasis there is in that part of the world, the better for everyone, especially uh, a nation without a military like Iceland. Thank you. Um, President Putin, with, with apologies to the rest of the panel, there are a few international uh, topics that I'd just like to, uh, to focus on for a moment. I know that the last time that, um, that we met in, in Moscow a year and a half ago, you scolded me for monopolizing too much of your time at the expense of your guests. So I promise I, I will get back to the Arctic. I won't monopolize you too much. Um, but the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is, is actually relevant to the broader conversation we had here. You talked earlier about energy prices. And Russia is keeping the world guessing um, in terms of what it's going to do um, about production cuts. Uh, we have an OPEC meeting coming up um, in, in June. Can I first ask you, do you agree with your energy minister that oil prices um, as they stand now are, are broadly acceptable for Russia? Well, I believe the Ministry of Energy of Russia would first and foremost have to agree to my position and my opinion. That would be the proper set of priorities in our work. And I have to tell you that the practice of work of the Russian government is such that we're always in touch. We always discuss those issues together. And we first and foremost proceed from the interests of the Russian economy and all of its diversity. We do not support uncontrollable price growth. Although we do set ourselves an objective to diversify Russian economy, we still understand that to a large degree it is 
focused on oil and gas production, but also on industrial production. And industrial output is also impacted by those extremely high oil prices. So it is important for us to balance this situation. We support balanced development of the international energy market. We're quite satisfied with the current level of oil prices. And we do see the amount of production in the United States. Uh, the output is growing there, although the United States seem to consume more than we do. If we take a look at that per day, we produce 11.5 millions of barrel. Yes, it's 11.5 million barrels. The United States produce more than that. We're quite satisfied with the current situation. However, together with our partners, the key oil producers being Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries, we're carefully monitoring the market and we've agreed that if need be, If it is necessary to unite our efforts, then in the second half of the year, we'll meet again and discuss the situation. At least we are open for further cooperation with the OPEC, and we're ready to work together to elaborate joint solutions. I would be very cautious there. We would be prepared to continue cooperation. However, whether that would be the decrease of the output or maybe that would be keeping the oil output at the current level, I'm not ready to say that yet. Although... What's your best guess right now? Well, I would say that Russian companies have plans to develop new oil deposits and we are watching that carefully. We realize that oil production should not be at a standstill because investment have to flow into the industry. Otherwise, it might create problems both for us and the international energy sector. So it will be a very balanced, wise solution. But we are set to continue our cooperation with the OPEC. And yet, I still like to get to your first question on the level of intention. I actually do not see particular military intention or uh, the Arctic being the military hotspot. The only thing is that NATO was conducting the largest military exercise in the region. We've never done anything of the kind. We were doing large-scale military exercises, but was very far from the area of responsibility of the NATO. It was in the east. And the second comment I want to make is that, and I want everybody to know that, we always we always invite international observers to all our military exercise, always, no exceptions. We do have certain agreements, and they are always there. And now coming to the aircrafts. Our military aircrafts are not flying over the territory of Norway. That doesn't happen. They were not there. And I hope they will never, ever be there. Yes, they were passing the neutral airspace. Those were the aircrafts of the neighboring country. And Madam Prime Minister is right. When that happens, there are other planes accompanying them or meeting them. That is what we do, be that, be that aircrafts or ships. So I do not see any considerable threats there. We simply have to monitor the situation. And the president of Finland, as a representative of a neutral country, some time ago came up with a suggestion that the military uh, aircraft have to fly with transponders turned on so that the aircraft can be easily identified. And we agreed, and we immediately made this proposal in our relationship with NATO. And the response of the NATO was negative. So I think you should ask NATO why they refused. I believe that was a very sensible idea. It was not a very simple technical solution. It wasn't technically easy for us either. But I've given such an instruction to the defense ministry, and they were ready to make it happening. But NATO refused. Otherwise, it would be very easy to identify what type of aircraft is flying where and what's happening there. And our aviation activity in the Baltic Sea, in the Arctic, is much lower as compared to the activities of the NATO countries. 
you should be aware of it. Can, can I just bring you back one, one last time to OPEC and then we can move on? Um, it sounds like you're still very much in wait and see mode when it comes to um, uh, production cuts. But do you think that the crisis that we're seeing in Venezuela, in Iran, and now in Libya, um, do they mean that cuts are no longer needed to support prices? Do they make it less likely we'll need cuts to support prices? Yes, certainly. We, we, we take all of that into account, the crisis in Venezuela. Well, Iran, there is no crisis there, but there are sanctions that that uh, restrict the country in terms of getting access to the world markets. There are other uh, issues in Libya in particular, and we p take all of that into account, and that is particularly what I had in mind when I said that we would follow the situation in the market closely. We bear in mind as well that the volume of uh, hydrocarbon consumption in summer uh, uh, grows. Well, well, we didn't see it. The uh, stock is quite big. They do not require much intervention. Yes, there are plans of our companies to explore new deposits, and we've got to bear that into mind. We have to help our companies, and that kind of assistance can be different whether they should start uh, digging right now or maybe we, we should help them uh, get access to different instruments from the government uh, assistance that helps them to achieve break-even. And we will we, we'll continue cooperating with OPEC, but all of that is also good, going to be taken into account. So I'll give that question, I'll give, I'll give it um, one last attempt. So the big question is, will Russia agree to extend production cuts to the end of September? Is that more likely or less likely? Well, we didn't cut. We simply we kept it at the current level without expanding our production. But if the market conditions are such that either stock goes up all of a sudden, maybe there are new factors that come into play, like the U.S. decides to seize Venezuelan oil and they will expand uh, the volume of Venezuelan oil getting to the world market, or maybe anything else is going to happen, and maybe some positive shifts are going to happen in Libya. Politically, for instance, maybe the situation in this country is going to normalize and Libya will get back to the world market. Or maybe someone decides all of a sudden that no more pressure should be exerted against Iran, and instead, there will be attempts to create such an environment so that Iran and Israel can uh, reconcile and maybe Iran will get back to the market. If any of this happens, we'll have to take all of that into account and take the decision accordingly. You are trying to, to wring an answer from me, but I'll tell you this. We're going to continue working with OPEC and take the decision in accordance with how the market goes on. I'm, I'm a journalist. I have to do my best. <laughs> um, so I have one final question for you on international affairs before we bring it back um, uh, to the Arctic. Um, so before this panel, uh, we reached out to users of... of yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, colleagues. I have nothing to do with that. Yeah. It's all my, you can blame me. It's all my fault, but we will get back to it. Um, before this panel, uh, we reached out to users of Bloomberg's social media platform. Um, it's called TikTok, and it attracts an audience of younger uh, news consumers from around the world. A lot of the questions that we had from them were about environmental matters that we've talked about. But unsurprisingly, and I think you know what's coming here, uh, the question of Russia's relations with the US um, also um, came up. Um, so I want to spend just a couple of minutes on that, and then we'll move on. Um, so at the Helsinki um, summit, uh, Trump um, invited you uh, to Washington. Um, now that the Mueller report is out of the way, do you think that Trump will be a better able to deliver on his promise of good relations with Russia? And are you expecting an invitation to the White House this year? You know, we have a good you know, there is a very good book in Russia. It's called uh, Twelve Chairs. And there is a 
saying there, come see us. Uh, our mother is going to be very glad to see you, but no address was left, so we don't know where to go. So the situation should be there, the conditions should be ripe. First, we, we discussed all that. We knew that this Mueller commission wouldn't find anything. We were the best to give an answer on that. Russia knows full well that it didn't interfere in any elections in the US. Moreover, there was no collusion that Mr. Mueller was trying to find between Trump, uh, President Trump and uh, Russia. We didn't know uh, Mr. Trump, yes, he did come to Moscow as a businessman, but it, it was not such a big event for us. It was simply absurd, and it was meant for internal audience, and it was used for political purposes and this internal political strife in the United States of America. So a mountain has given birth to a mouse, and this is what happened. Well, we knew this would happen, and I have always told you. And now it has happened. But because of that, the situation, the internal political situation in the US has not uh, become any better. There are attempts to find new uh, pretexts to attack President Trump. I'm sorry, I digress. But I think uh, it testifies to a certain element of a crisis and the U.S. political system per se. Just have a look at what is happening. The groups that are mounting an offensive against the legitimately elected president are simply, as a matter of fact, trying to, to cancel the, the vote. They do not agree to what the people have said. And it is a crisis of the political system. This is something unseen before. Yes, the pre-electoral campaign can be very harsh. But if a, a candidate emerges victorious, then uh, the strife finishes and everyone rallies behind the new president to accomplish the national tasks. But this is not what has happened in the US. The strife, the division is still there. You see? What happened? There are groups that put their group interest above national interests. I'm not trying to defend President Trump. We have many differences. And in his administration, a great many sanctions have been introduced against Russia. This is something we do not agree to and we will never agree to. And uh, we believe that is counterproductive. But should a dialogue be resumed between the US and Russia, a fully fledged dialogue on an equal footing, in particular on issues that present great interest both to us and to the whole humanity, I refer in particular to a dialogue on disarmament, then would be very glad to have that. And we're open and willing to do that. Pres President, Trump, President Trump says he feels vindicated by the Mueller report. President Putin, on, on a personal level, do you, after everything that's happened, President Trump calls it a witch hunt, after everything that's happened, do you feel happy for him on a personal level at the outcome of the Mueller report? President Trump is a witch hunt. President Trump knows better what a witch hand is. We, we know uh, what a witch hand is. And it is a black plague in American history. And I would hate it to repeat once again. I have one final question on this. In, at the famous Helsinki press conference, one more, the last one, I promise. Um, you said that you hoped Trump would win the 2016 election because he promised to make relation, relations with Russia better. Do you want him right now? Do you want him to win again in 2020? Well, I've told you already that we have many differences on international issues, on uh, the settlement of certain crises, but there are also elements of cooperation too. However different our approach is to the Syrian solution, we, we still cooperate there. And we work together on Syria. There are some common issues in the Arctic. In, but incidentally, there is what we have gathered here. Yes, the US has many interests in the Arctic zone. 
We have many issues related to climate change as a whole. We know full well that the U.S. Uh, didn't sign the Paris Agreement, and the administration has a rationale explaining why they did that. I do not think uh, this uh, is... Uh, reason to attack the current administration. I only think that a dialogue is needed in order to find a common solution, because without the U.S. participation in this process, just as uh, without China or India, the world community is not going to be efficient in achieving this goal, uh, because uh, the U.S. emits a lot of greenhouse gases. We have to understand that. So we need to find a solution. We have to somehow engage the U.S. in a dialogue. As far as I understand, President Trump doesn't reject that notion entirely. Secondly, I believe sometimes decisions are made uh, under the internal political pressure. And we do hope that once the situation normalizes, new prospects are going to open up for cooperation on a bilateral basis on all the avenues I've uh, mentioned. I refer to terrorism, to epidemics, to environmental issues, disarmament. I believe we are all interested in working on those matters. But once the conditions are ripe in the U.S., we'll start this cooperation, whether we want that or not. Well, it is not at, at to up, uh, up to us to want our this is not the sphere where such categories as I want, I don't want, apply. We respect the choice of the American people. Whoever is elected as a president, we're going to work with him or her. Okay. Now I promise to bring it back uh, back to the uh, to the Arctic. Um, one of one of the um, issues that we haven't uh, spoken much about um, on this panel is is China's increasing um, interest um, in the Arctic. They're talking about the I think the northern. The northern polar route, route as, well, as, 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 as part of their um, Silicon Road uh, dialogue. Maybe I can ask President Johannesson, what sort of role do you see for, for China um, in the Arctic? Obviously, a big power like China is uh, interested in uh, observing. Uh, the changes in the Arctic. We have been devoting some of this uh, meeting to. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Mm. Uh, I believe that the government of Iceland uh, is observing uh, Chinese uh, attitudes and initiatives. And it goes without saying that uh, when and if a new line of communication opens up, uh, we will have countries on one side, the big countries in the Far East and others, uh, China, Japan, Southeast Asia, so on and so forth. And at the other end, we will have uh, uh, Europe as, a, as, a, as an end destination and as a possible uh, transit point for further mm -hmm. commerce. And uh, it goes without saying that the uh, authorities and companies in China are taking part in this uh, development. So uh, uh, we, as a slightly smaller nation than China, will only observe that. Mm. Thank you. So I've been, I've been told that um, we're coming to the end of our time. Um, so I, I would like to s close uh, by asking um, each of you, perhaps in 90 seconds, or as short as you can, to sum up, as the Arctic, I guess to answer this question, as the Arctic opens up, no. one moment, no. President Putin. I'm sorry, on the Northern Sea Route, that is a very important matter. From Yokohama to Rotterdam, it takes uh, 33 days to go through the Indian Ocean, whereas it's just 20 through the Northern Sea Route. It's 7,300 kilometers, whereas it's almost 12,000 kilometers through the Indian Ocean. So it's going to be a, a great saving. So it's very attractive. It's going to be attractive not to China only, but to Indonesia, to Japan, to South Korea. It's a very interesting, a very promising 
area for international cooperation. And this international cooperation should bring us uh, closer together, not f further apart. Understood. So as we wrap up, I'd like to ask each of you to tell me, perhaps in 90 seconds, what you see as the biggest opportunity um, as the Arctic opens up and the biggest risk or the biggest source of worry as the Arctic opens up. Prime Minister Solberg, maybe you can start us off. Well, I think the opportunities are vast in the Arctic area, of course, for research, for development, cooperation, for new industrial uh, activities. But the challenge is, of course, is that this is an area where the nature is more vulnerable than in most other areas, where the goat season is shorter, that impact of environmental um, uh, problems will be uh, much further and much more difficult to handle. And of course, with more activity, there will always be more challenges, for example, for search and rescue. Uh, we see that the economic, um, the economic uh, strength of Norway is moving more northern uh, mm -hmm. because of oil and gas exploration, but also because of the economic activity that goes on in the northern part of our own country, which is a benefit uh, for our society. But what we do need is cooperation on those areas where if there is more maritime transportation, Norway is a large naval country, it needs us to be even better prepared for, research, for, for rescue operation, for, for environmental challenges. And this we have to work together and also the impact of the people who are living there. This is a large area for indigenous people also mm -hmm. who are living more traditional and we have to make sure that they are participating in that development. President Inesto. Yes. <clears throat> I believe we just discussed about connectivity. That is the uh, benefit, great benefit. And it's a benefit for indigenous people to improve their living standards. Risks. I will take up this uh, security risk. Uh, Vladimir, you referred to our proposal that is uh, uh, militarily unaligned Finland. We proposed um, uh, using transponders in the Baltic Sea area. The idea is that we should have a warning system so that nothing unexpected or accidents take place. Uh, in Baltic Sea, it's very narrow. For example, our airspace was, there was a breach of our airspace a couple of weeks ago by a Portuguese plane. But um, nevertheless, we should have a common warning system and maybe we can take up uh, uh, during Iceland uh, chairmanship whether we are able to, uh, to build up a warning system and a rescue system too. President Johansson. <laughs> I was going to give you the final word, President Putin. So. <laughs> All right. There's a lot to say, of course, but uh, let me just go back to um, the uh, slogan of Iceland as we assume the chairmanship in the Arctic Council uh, later this year in, in May towards a sustainable uh, Arctic, together towards a sustainable Arctic with the focus on the marine environment, with the focus on uh, climate and green energy solutions, and with a focus on uh, the indigenous populations uh, in the Arctic. And I certainly agree with President Ninesto that search and rescue and uh, options and uh, the potential for future cooperation there is, is something we should really take a look at, uh, if not only because of the um, the incident uh, Prime Minister Solberg has also referred to with the, with the uh, cruiser of the coast of Norway. Uh, let that be as a, as a warning to us as to what might happen in, uh, in the more riskier waters of the, of the Arctic. And uh, to conclude, I guess we're all getting a bit tired here. I just want to thank President Putin again, the Russian government, and our hosts here, we, myself, my team, we have been warmly received here. We have enjoyed hospitality and kindness, and we are thankful for that. And uh, I look forward to welcoming many of you 
uh, in Iceland as we assume the chairmanship of the Arctic Council and uh, we'll have the opportunity to repay the kindness we have received here and uh, move forward towards a sustainable future in the Arctic. Thank you very much. Well, uh, the possibility is, is, of course, the, the, the richness of this, uh, this region. And I'm not talking uh, only about the resources that we have uh, on the ground, so to speak, uh, but we have so many possibilities. But uh, and we, we see also the, the globalization means that more and more people, more and more countries would be interested in, in this region. So I, and I'm, I mean, China is growing dramatically for a number of years now. In the future, it'll be other countries in Southeast Asia. It will be African countries. So, so this all means that we, we, we have also a huge interest in, in our region. I will, I will say this. We need low tension. That is, uh, I think it's key for all of us, for the security of our people, and for, for many reasons for the whole world. We need to combat climate change, knowing that it is, uh, it is happening in the Arctic area, but we also know that the, the lowering of the decreasing of the, the ice sea uh, uh, um, volume in the Arctic is a dramatic change for the tropic part of the world, mm -hmm. because there you see the real sea level rise. So I, I, I take this as an opportunity so that we can regard this as a global uh, issue. Uh, work with sustainability, not only combat climate change here right now, but also with uh, sustainability for the whole region. Uh, cooperating on research will help us, and Sweden will proudly uh, also deliver on that. We, we have, I think, a very important and an important um, uh, icebreaker, Odin, that uh, this, uh, where we can that we can use for research and be a, a good partner in that. And last but not least, uh, the issue that the president from Iceland touched upon, the people that are living there, mm. the indigenous people and uh, all the other populations in this area, uh, that we respect them and show them that we, we want a result and a development that is uh, good for them, prosperous for the people that live there. Thank you. President Putin, I'll give you the final word. Well, I think that uh, the main opportunities which, which we can get uh, exploring Arctic, the Arctic is the four, are the following. First, reserves, world-level world reserves of resources, and they should work for the benefit of the entire humanity. That is very important on the basis of international rules, on the basis of agreements, regional agreements, or uh, agreements between region and um, other countries, they should serve the entire humanity. We should use additional opportunities in the transport sector, communications. The main threats has to do with the environment, have to do with the environment. Well, I pity our uh, bears, uh, polar bears especially. Uh, well, we should protect the fauna. Uh, because of the uh, global warning, because of the exploration of the Arctic, the risks will grow, and we should take this into account. That's why it's so important um, for us to get together today and uh, keep uh, talking with each other uh, in the future under the chairmanship uh, of our colleague who is sitting left on my left uh, and who will uh, chair the um, Arctic Council, um, I'm sure that our Arctic Council decisions, well, they are just recommendations, but uh, nevertheless, they are very important, which have a very high moral value and political value, and they should take into account by all players while implementing their national policies and plans. We should coordinate our efforts. That's why cooperation in the Arctic, uh, it's a very uh, important opportunity. So this is a good example of how we should uh, solve uh, global problems, global issues. We should solve them together. I'd like to thank you, and I'd like to thank colleagues who came uh, here today to discuss these issues here to St. Pete. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.